All right, welcome to another episode of Inspire People Impacts Lives. I'm your host, Josh Kosnick, Managing Partner, Northwestern Mutual. And today I am excited as all get up to have Thomas Williams, former NFL player, now NFL player engagement ambassador, author, speaker, and philanthropist. Thomas works with athletes, students, and professionals, challenging, challenging them to push beyond a mundane lifestyle and enter into a life of greatness. I hope everyone's buckled up just because we've had 15 minutes of pre-show convo and his energy is awesome. And I uh, just want to welcome you to the show, Thomas. Josh, thanks so much, man. Yeah, we could have kept going and then I didn't realize we weren't recording and I was like, wait, that wasn't part of the show. So no, that was, let's, let's, let's let's bring it back again. What's funny is I actually was like, I'm almost like, Chad, hey, we got some good stuff here. We might as well hit record. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, I'm excited and, and thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited and pumped to, uh, to tag team, man, and, and give the world a dose of some inspiration. Awesome. So and we were talking before about where you're at at USC and the, and the games and the player that you were, but uh, why don't you give uh, the audience more of a, you know, where you came up, about yourself, siblings, prominent mentors, any interesting facts and tidbits for the audience to get to know you a little bit better? Yeah, I came, uh, I was a uh, big time kid from a big town city named Vacaville. You probably have heard of it. Most people have not. And uh, every time I tell people where I'm from, they're like, Victorville. I'm like, yeah, I, I sure it's close. It's in the same state. But Vacaville, super small town between Sacramento and San Francisco, uh, played football, played baseball, kind of just pretty much played whatever was on the TV screen uh, growing up, earned a scholarship, played at USC, only started 10 games in my NFL, or career at USC, ended up getting drafted in 2008, 155th overall, went to Jacksonville. Um, when I first got there, they said, welcome to South Georgia. And I, th I thought I got drafted and I was going to Miami or Orlando, something cool like that. And they were like, nope, welcome to South Georgia. We, uh, we were just coming off of 11 and five season, Jacksonville was. And so I was like, great, you drafted me, got some other good players. This is going to be, you know, one of those 13 and three seasons. Uh, but unfortunately, we we're five and 11. And then uh, my transition from team to team kind of began there where I went from there to New England, had a cup of coffee in Buffalo, and then I shut it down in Carolina. In 2011, I had a career near neck injury, which unfortunately for me was the end of my road where the doctor said, Thomas, do you want to play for a couple more years or do you want to walk for the rest of your life? And so I took the latter. And here I am today. Um, when you talk about mentors, um, the people that I think about were the ones that believed in me when I couldn't believe in myself. And so I think about my, my high school coach, who's now uh, a superintendent over the Vacaville Unified School District. And uh, he always tried to encourage me to, to step outside of my comfort zone. When I wanted to quit football, he was like, nope, you can't do it. Same thing in college. Uh, mentor, one of my great friends, Ken Norton Jr., who's the defensive coordinator for the Seattle Seahawks. Phenomenal mentor um, who gave me a great piece of advice that I love sharing with people when – I was going into my senior year in college and I wasn't starting as many games as I would like to and thought the end of the road was going to be right there. And I said, coach, why should I continue to fight for this dream that it doesn't look like it's going to happen? Like, like, can you give me some advice? And he said something that stuck with me still to this day. And he said, if you give your dream of going to the NFL, everything you possibly have that's inside of you and they don't want you, maybe they don't deserve you. And that just kind of changed my whole perspective of like, hey, that's right. Give it everything you have because maybe your dream doesn't deserve you, but you definitely deserve your dream. Um, and as a speaker, as a as a uh, trainer, as a facilitator, mentors, John Gordon, where he told me a couple of years ago, he said, Thomas, how are you doing in your career? This is the first day I met him. And I said, man, you're definitely going to be a light in my life. I said, uh, John, I'm, I'm tired. I'm, I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to motivate people more. I don't want to inspire people anymore. And he's like, that's because you're focused on the fruit, the fruit. You just want the stuff. You want the money. You want the accolades. You want the status. You want the success. He said, you got to focus on the root. What's the purpose? What's the reason? What's the meaning behind things that you do? He said, when people focus on the root or the fruit, they neglect the root and the tree dies. And from that moment, man, I was like, you're absolutely right. I said, you're going to be my mentor. So those are the mentors that have been uh, extremely influential in my life. And um, every single day I wake up, I honor them by paying what they gave me. I pay it forward. That's so good, man. John Gordon is awesome for those that don't know him yet, which if you have been living under a rock, I could understand, but uh, <laughs> 
John Gordon has written so many books. The first one I read was The Energy Bus, which was his big breakout. Uh, but from The Seed to The Carpenter to which was the one on uh, the locker room, the more football training story. camp, training camp, training camp was awesome. Yeah, uh, man, so many good books that he's written. And so have, I've heard him speak live a couple different times. He's been big throughout Northwestern Mutual. Uh, just an awesome, awesome person. But I want to get actually what uh, Ken, Norton, Ken Norton Jr. told you. Yeah. Um, great linebacker, great coach, uh, and father, great boxer. Uh, so uh, athletic family. But what he told you, what I found about that is, is, is I loved his advice. What I've seen with so many people and why his advice was so profound to you is that so many people will use what you, your experience as an excuse Right. They'll say because the, and maybe it's even subconscious sometimes if I don't give it at all, I can and I quit. I can always go, well, I could have done that. Right. Well, I could have made it had I just done X, Y and Z. So true. Right. And so he, true. he told you he was like, no, you got to give it your all. And then so much more would have taken. I mean, not only did you make it, but even if you didn't, you at least can walk away from that experience saying, I, I did it. I tried my best yeah. and it just wasn't for me. Yeah, Josh. I mean, you're so right. I mean, I think at that moment I was looking for almost the excuse that you're talking about. It was like, yeah, you're right. You should probably stop playing football, kind of enjoy your last year in college, but no, he challenged me. And I think that's something that I, that I paid, you know, forward, like I was talking about. And I think it was something that gave me the liberty. It kind of gave me the freedom of no, 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 Thomas, this thing in life, it's not about what you acquire. It's not about what you get. It's not even about, what's going to happen once you become an NFL football player, if you do, or if you don't, it's about the things that you are going to become. It's about who you're becoming in this process. And I'll give you a funny story. It's like, you know, being locked up, you know, on quarantine in the house for the last year, almost um, it's, it's been hard. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you the thing that's helped me, Josh, so much is that I got cut when I was in the NFL, I got cut from every team. I got cut from Jacksonville. I got cut from New England. I got cut from Buffalo. I even got cut from Seattle. I was literally there for like three weeks and I got cut and I'd have to come home. And it was like just me being in the house by myself. And at the time it didn't feel good. And at the time I didn't understand the purpose of it. And at the time I didn't understand this was actually working for me and not to me. It was that's having that experience has actually allowed me to get comfortable at being home not being able to go anywhere. I didn't have any money. I didn't have an income. I didn't have a job. I didn't have, and to be honest with you, quite frankly, I was embarrassed to walk outside my house and people go, Hey, aren't you the football guy who used to play at USC? Cause I was living in LA, downtown LA, you know, big USC town. Shout out to all my UCLA haters over there. But anyways, <laughs> so it's one of those things where, you know, I understood that, Oh, this is, this is what Norton was talking about. It's not what happens to you, what happens for you. And so, so many times in life, we have this perception of poor me, poor me, poor me, not understanding. I'm reading this book right now. It's called The Obstacles Away, Ryan Howard, or Holiday. And so what it's talking about is like, it's the things that are happening are actually your advantages, right? So I grew up, I didn't have my father in my life. We have a great relationship now. He's a phenomenal grandfather. Like, that's my guy. Um, but he wasn't in my life early on. And I just remember when I got to ninth grade and guys were working out and they were like, let's go to the gym. And I was a little bit of a late bloomer when it came to like working out because my dad didn't teach me how to do push-ups and pull-ups and sit-ups. And a lot of these things that parents I think should, you know, want to do and, and should encourage their kids to do is work out. And so the gym became my father. And so when my friends were going to baseball games or hanging out with their dad and going on bike rides and hikes on the weekends, I was going to the gym. So my advantage is I was getting three to four hours of working out every week more than my friends. So at the end of the month, I was, you know, that was 16 hours that I've gotten quote unquote better. Now, if I would have just sat at home and I would just sulked in it and I would have thought, poor me, poor me, poor me, then that would have been, a, 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 as we call it, a victim's mentality. And then woe is me because so many times we don't understand that our disadvantage is our advantage, right? Being, being broke as an entrepreneur, starting a company, your creativity is your, your oyster. You can literally do everything that you would like to. But as you know, when you get board members, you get investors, you get other people who are kind of chiming in, your creativity is a little limited. And so when you're a party of one, you can literally do anything that you want to. But some people look at um, disadvantages as 
the period. That's the, the, the hill. That's the mountaintop as opposed to, man, is this an obstacle or is this an opportunity? Because if it's an opportunity, this is about to get fun. Mm -hmm. This is about to be exciting. If it's an obstacle, oh man, this sucks. But so it's all about how you look at it. Are you the person, you know, as, as you, you mentioned this, uh, Coach Carroll had this thing the first day of training camp for all the underclassmen, so the freshmen and the transfers, where he would talk about perspective because he's a big mind guy, right? See it, believe it, repetition, competition, all of these things. And so he'd bring guys in. He said, there's two ways of looking at training camp, guys. He said, I'll tell you a story. There's one kid that walks into a room and there's a whole bunch of poop over there in the corner. And the kid walks out and yells to his parents and he's pissed off. And he's like, I can't believe it. You guys sent me into a room with all this poop. He said, now there's a second boy who walks into the same room. He's digging through the poop. And it's like, you're thinking he's nuts. He's crazy. He's playing in the poop. Are you kidding me? And he walks out and his parents are like, why are you so excited? He said, with all that poop in that room, there's got to be a pony in there somewhere. <laughs> and so with the mindset of having to be a pony. So every single room you walk into, whether it's poop, whether it's, you know, obstacles, whether it's adversity, there's got to be a pony in there somewhere. And I think for those four and five years that I was in college, I got a free lesson in mindset, mind control and adversity breakthrough. And so one of the greatest things that I was given from the game of football is perspective. Yeah, that is awesome. So what you're talking about is the journey. And that's really what uh, John Gordon was getting at with you as well, is not focusing on the fruit and the outcome, but who you're becoming in the meanwhile. And so that's true. really what's what's for you is all that mm -hmm. all that adversity and that journey that you're upon is going to turn you into the person that you are today. That is awesome. And we you talked about you gave Ryan Holiday a shout out there. That was my favorite book from last year. Oh, uh, really? I read personally. That was yeah. So I got to it from all the connections here is I got to it from It Takes What It Takes by Trevor mm. Moad, who references Ryan Holiday's book. And Trevor Moad is Russell Wilson's coach. Yeah. So he's done a lot of work with Seattle and Coach Carroll. So, I mean, come full circle. We talked about a lot there. And, and um, yeah, that, that book is phenomenal. So anyone that hasn't read it and Ryan Holiday, Trevor Moad, uh, what they're really studying and teaching us is stoicism from the ancients. So we hear all these Marcus Aurelius quotes, Epictetus quotes, and people are like take it just out of context or just take it as it is. Those were the original Stoics. And yep. that's what these uh, storytellers like Trevor and Ryan are teaching us today. So good. So good, man. I think it's like one of those things that reminds you that, hey, don't soften up but soften up to absorb, but don't soften up so that you clam up, like really embrace all of it. Look at the whole room. A buddy of mine, who's a former football player, uh, Keith Rivers played with him in college. Number nine pick overall in the 2008 NFL draft is now into art, like has a beautiful art collection. And for me, my eye is not trained or, or sharpened in that field at all. So I walk in and I'm like this stupid you spent all your money on this and like i look at it in a certain way and then he looks at it literally goes takes two steps over this way now look at these same three pictures what do you see and i'm like it's telling a story he goes art is completely about what is the story that's being told being painted etc and so i feel like us as you know humans if we can get a little bit sharper and not do what I do when I step into Keith's house and look at his collection and say, this is stupid. I mean, like, what do you see when you see all of it? Yeah, that's so good. So let's go back to, I mean, man, you just went through so much good stuff that people can take away if they slow that down. Um, when do you feel like you started becoming the person that you are today? Man, so two extremely impactful events, I'll call them hits happened in my life. One happened when I was in eighth grade going into ninth grade. And one happened when I was 27 years old. The first one was eighth grade. I'm playing in a baseball tournament in Oklahoma. I'm on second base. My teammate who comes up behind me hits the ground ball to right field. I round third going home. Catcher's about four feet in front of home plate. So I'm like, do I slide? Do I go around him? Do I hop over him? I was like, I'm going to lower my shoulder. So I boom, lower my shoulder, get called out. Thought I was going to get kicked out of the game, get yelled at by my mom and coaches. They didn't do any of that. But I'll tell you what happened was it was when we went home, we lost that game. We finished like fifth in the country. I went home and I'm in the laundry room doing laundry with my mom. And my mom tells me, asked me, she goes, what are you going to do now that you have two weeks left in summer? And I was like, mom, I'm going to chill. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to play video games and hang out with my boys. She goes, I got a better idea. 
how about this? You can either play football or you can get a job. I was like, okay, I'm going to get, I'm going to play football. There's no way I'm working. And because up until that point, I wanted to be a major league baseball player. And so I started playing football because I didn't want to get a job. And again, football taught me the discipline, the structure, the resiliency, the perseverance on the field. But what I learned on the field, I applied in life. And when I tell you, I went from a 2.3 grade point average in eighth grade to a 3.5 grade point average in ninth grade, only because I took the same things that I learned on the practice field and I applied it in life. I didn't understand the A gap, which is the gap between the center and the guard. I didn't understand the four hole, which is to the right side. I didn't understand any of these things because in my mind, I was gonna play major league baseball. And, it, and so I came to practice early. Coach, tell me a little bit more about this gap. Tell me about the defense. Tell me about the offense. Oh, math teacher. So there's a letter and a number. It's supposed to equal something. Tell me a little bit about it. And Mr. Muma in ninth grade gave me the best piece of advice that I learned. I learned it in ninth grade, applied it through high school, applied it in college. And it was, if you show up before class, a teacher will help you. If you show up before you're supposed to be there, somebody who knows the information is going to teach you. And so I showed up and that was my hardest class. And once I looked on my, when I got my great report card at the end of that first semester, my mom calls me in the kitchen. She goes, whose report card is this? And usually I'm thinking that I'm gonna get C's and D's. So I'm gonna get restricted, no more video games, no more going outside. So I'm like, yes, they sent the wrong report card. That means that Monday I'm gonna get the right report card, but at least I can play through the weekend. She showed it to me and it was a 3.5. I was like, yeah, whose report card is that? (laughs) And I looked up and it was my name. And she said, now I want you to know this is the bar. This is what you're capable of doing. So whatever you did to get this, make sure you keep doing this moving forward. So that was the first hit. Before you get to the second hit, before you get to the second hit, what made you so curious? Because I've done some of those, you know, I don't even like, I remember. So I was a soccer player growing up. So similar to you. Right. And, uh, and I credit soccer with making me a good wide receiver the footwork that it took to be a good soccer player helped me be a good wide receiver. But I didn't go and ask coaches like that. I didn't have that wherewithal. I didn't have a father that teach taught me that type of stuff. Um, So I thought I look back at that as like, you were like mature beyond your years to, or maybe you're just born with that curiosity. I don't know, but speak to that a little bit because you were asking really good questions to really seek to understand. Yeah. I hate not knowing. I hate it. I still, I'm 36 years old and I hate not knowing. And so at 13, 14 years old, when we'd step on the football field and I'm like, dude, I've been beating your tail in recess ever since we were in third grade. There's no way you're better than me, but you're getting to the hole faster than me. You're making the play quicker than me. You're recognizing this a little bit better than I am. I'm a newbie. I'm the, I'm the biggest out here. I'm the fastest out here. I'm the strongest out here, but I'm the weakest. And so, cause I didn't know I needed to ask. Mm-hmm. And then when I saw my buddy, Joey, per- so I did that on the football field. And again, I did that in the classroom and I saw Joey Perkins showing up to class before me and Joey used to get A's all the time. Joey, we get A's and I'm looking, I'm like, Joey, we sit right next to each other. How are you getting A's? And all of a sudden one day I sh- my mom dropped me off to school early and I just, just walked by the class and I saw Joey walk into the classroom and I was like, you SOB. <laughs> you son of a gun. I can't believe you, man. Oh, I thought you were just smarter than me. Oh, you're just working harder than me. Mm-hmm. And so when I went in there and I followed in there one, one day, he was asking his specific questions because when we go to class, the teacher teaches general information. There's no personal access, so to speak. Right. Yeah, you might get one question or answer too, but Joey was getting his questions. He would do his homework. He would come in with his questions. I was like, Oh, I can do this. You're just telling me I just have to show up to school before. Like nothing's going on at home. Like I'm an only child. It's not like my siblings are in the house having a great time and I'm going to miss out on this. It's not like my mom's going to work, like get your butt to class early, get your questions answered and get good grades. Mom already said that you can do it. She told you, keep doing what you're doing, do the same thing there. And then the same thing kind of just rolled into to football. So, I mean, it's one of the things that I teach my student athletes and we'll get into it that now is that I teach them. People think that sports is the way that you do life, but life is actually the way that you play sports. And once I got that understanding that who you are in the streets, who you are 
in your community, who you are in the classroom. If you're going to cheat on a test, you're going to cheat in the game. That's just what it is. The way you do one thing is the way you do everything. Tell them, Josh. Tell them, Josh. That's what I'm talking about. All right. Hit two. Sorry, I had to interrupt and ask you that. No, man. Hit number two. Uh, hit number two came the second time I hurt my neck in the NFL. So I had a neck injury in 2011, and the same thing happened in 2012. And I heard a whisper and that feeling, that, that, that intuition, just like you're finished, you're done. And so after I got done playing football, I was in Tampa Bay at the time. I was literally on their team for 48 hours. I flew from Tampa Bay all the way back to Los Angeles and not to get too spiritual, but this is my journey. This is my story. I went to church that Sunday. This was a a Thursday. I flew home on a Friday. I went to church on a Sunday. I walked through the church doors and I heard my chains are gone and now I'm free. Now I, now when I heard that, I knew that how much football consumed me. I knew that that's all I did. That was, that's what I did every single day, every single moment. That's what I ate, thought about, slept. That's what I was here for. And once I heard that, I was like, wow, this is going to be a great service. Walked into church and man, it's clear as day. I felt God tell me that you thought football was your purpose, but it was just your passion to lead you to your purpose. Now I'm going to show you exactly what you're created to do. And what I'm created to do is I'm created to service people. I'm created to inspire and motivate people. I did it on the field. I'm supposed to do it in life. I, could, I did it on the field until I was 27 years old. I'm supposed to do it in life for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And so those two hits impacted me the most, even though they were the un- most uncertain, most powerful collision, but even more so, they were the ones that turned out again for me and not to me. That is such good stuff, man. Thank you for sharing. And you can get spiritual on the show because I want people to be who they are. Like I, yeah, I yeah. talk about all the time. Is like, so I'm Christian, but I tell people come as they are. And, you know, your story is your story. So you can't take that away from you. Of course. So, so that is awesome. Um, so you help players transition now. So before I ask you how you go about that is – you, we talked pre-show about your transition, that hit, right? Yeah. But we didn't talk about how emotionally that happened. So was there emotion before that church service that hit you? And you talk through that with people now and how the different emotions that hit you to help them overcome that? Because it's probably different for everyone as far as how their career ends. But the emotions are probably the same, right? Yeah, the emotions are the same. I mean, you go through the five stages of grief. And so for me, I had just been conditioned for so long to be a machine. Most of us, I don't know uh, if people were able to read. um, I think it's Martellus, Marcellus Bennett, uh, ESPN and TMZ. And he was just talking about how we're conditioned as athletes, football players, kind of be these warriors, like the ones who just don't feel anything, don't experience anything, like just have no emotions, which was such a profound perspective. And I loved it. And I think that it just really captures the, the, the feeling and the emotion that you go through when you're done playing. Because for me, Every single thing that I'd been through up until that point, the bad, the ugly, the things that you don't like, football was a release. It's a physical release. You're bothered on something. Somebody cuts you off in, in, at a red light on, a, you know, on the freeway. You're, you're, you're late for something. Just things don't go your way. You hold it up. You bottle it up. It doesn't bother you. And for those 60 minutes or you know, two hours on a practice field, you literally leash hell on your opponent, your teammates to get ready. I I see you nodding because you're like, yep, I get it. I know exactly what you're talking about. And the thing about it is you don't have that release when you're done playing. And so for me, I noticed that I had a problem when I got done playing and I was getting ready to get written up uh, for a parking ticket. Yep. I parked in the red. I was running in the subway to get a sandwich. But again, I'm a football player. I'm a professional athlete. The world uh, revolves around me. So I can do, the rules apply to everyone else except me, right? I'm entitled, 27 years old. I've, you know, reached the pinnacle of this sport. I think that that's what my existence is. I come outside and this guy writes me a ticket and I'm like, man, I was here for five minutes. I'm, you know, justifying my actions. Right is right, wrong is wrong. Doesn't apply to me. And as soon as he handed me the ticket, I reached to grab him. And at that moment, it was like, that was my rock bottom. I have a problem because when somebody tells me I'm wrong, I'm going to try to physically deter, 
shift, transition your point of reference. Because if I can't say it to you, if I can't get you to think it physically, I can do something to make you change your mind. That was problem number one. The second issue I had was, and this is when I knew that I had, I was experiencing a lot of mental health issues from the transition because of everything that had been stored up inside of me since I was a child. I was at a golf tournament and when I was, um, after the golf tournament, we were sitting, eating, hanging out. And I heard, a, I, and this is going to sound weird, but I heard a voice inside of me. It's like, you don't want to be here. I, was like, I don't want to be here. And so the people who invited me to the charity golf tournament, I thanked them, you know, thanks for the hospitality. I walk outside, I get in my car, I start driving away. And the same thought came in my head. I don't want to be here. I'm like, I was just there, but I left. And at that moment, I realized I was thinking about, I don't want to be on this earth. Life isn't fun anymore. Like to, to, to wake up and know that you're playing a different opponent to making, you know, a certain amount of money from going, you know, from city to city where you walk into a restaurant and people know who you are when you don't have to wait at a dentist appointment. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And I knew that like, you got to fix this because if you don't, this is going to take a hold of you. And I called the mentor of mine and they said, Thomas, now's the time. And I said, now's the time for what? They said, for your whole entire life, you've been sweeping everything under the rug. And now that you've been sweeping that thing under the rug, that rug has gotten high enough and now it's starting to trip you. Mm. And I was like, wow. And that was in two, that was in March of 2012. And uh, man, I've been seeing a therapist. So what that, what that encouraged me to do is to talk about it. There's not a right or wrong way for me to feel because there's no rule book on this. Hey, you're going to transition from one job to the next, from one career to the next, from one purpose to the next, whatever it is. How should I feel? Well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't feel, you should be fine. You should be happy. I wouldn't, you know, and you get all these other opinions and not knowing that, Hey, these are my emotions. These are my true feelings. I don't know how I'm supposed to feel, which is actually driving me a little bit more crazy until you talk to a therapist and exactly what you just did a couple of minutes ago. Hey man, come as you are. And that's what my therapist said. Hey, what's up? Nothing. And it almost reminds me of a uh, goodwill hunting um, where uh, Robert Williams and um, uh, Matt Damon, Yeah, uh, you know, he's sitting in the, he's sitting in his chair and for a couple of, couple of sessions, he doesn't say anything because he doesn't want to be vulnerable. He doesn't want to open up. He doesn't want to express. I was the same way. Like I'd walk into my ther therapist's office and he was like, like literally got to the point, Josh, where he was like, why'd you come? I was like, I don't know. Until it was finally like, start with anything. And it was everything from childhood abandonment issues, from identity issues, from being biracial and growing up in a predominantly white community to dad, not being in my life to not, you know, to being thinking I was poor when I was growing up and, you know, the stuff about money and, and identity with that and attachments and, and worth and value. And all of these things where I was like, Oh, now we can get somewhere. So the reason why I got good at football isn't because I was running to greatness on the football field. It was because I was running from all the pain that I was experiencing in my personal life. And so I just became obsessed with it and I applied the same, you know, tenacity and put all of my energy and focus into football. And that's how I got really good. Um, but it wasn't until I got done playing where I was able to identify that. And so talking to the other athletes is, yeah, we got to work on our identity because our identity just shifted and we're not who we thought we were. We're actually two people. One of the questions that I had for my therapist was, I wonder if I'm a fraud. And he was like, a fraud, like how I said, because for so long I said, am I, am I a nice guy pretending to be mean? So am I, am I a nice guy who I am in life pretending to be mean on game day? Or am I a mean, mean guy pretending to be nice? And I didn't understand that. And he said, you're both. Mm -hmm. like, what do you mean I'm both? He said, mm -hmm. you are both. And it's perfectly okay to be both because if some, you were trained, you were conditioned that if somebody puts your hands on you, put your hands on them, right? It's a reaction. I'm a linebacker. As soon as an offensive lineman comes to block me, shock and shed, get them off. You get to the ball by any means necessary, do whatever it takes. He said, so you're both. It's just kind of like the story, you know, of the, 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 the grandfather sitting down with his grandson saying, Grandpa, I got two dogs inside of me. You know, one that's good, one that's bad. Which one am I? And he said, you know, whichever one you feed the most. Yep. And so um, I just had to start feeding myself, 
you know, or feeding the positive, the nice guy, so to speak, um, who I am so that uh, eventually the, the mean guy would starve. Well, thank you for uh, sharing your story on, on the mental health side of things, because uh, seeing a therapist like us men are conditioned from early on. And I think the world's getting a little bit better. Uh, there's a little bit more talking about it, but there's still not enough from whether it's military, whether it's football, whether it's any, any like type A personality, machismo driven area, us as men are not taught to talk about our emotions. We're not taught to uh, seek counsel. Like we're, we're told that's for pussies. We're told that's for women. We're told that's for all the, everyone but us. So thank you for sharing your story and giving people the opportunity like, look, it's okay to go talk to someone. Yeah. However you want to phrase it, because I know that some people say, oh, I don't want to see a shrink. <laughs> but like, no, you're, you're seeking counsel, a mentor, someone that just can be bipartisan or unpartisan like yep. to your situation and just be able to talk through things. And the majority of the best people are doing that, listen and let you figure out your stuff. Not so true. All but for you. Yeah, so, so true. Thank you for that. And then uh, the other thing I was thinking about as you are talking about the other uh, athletes that you help is I, I wonder, is it easier to talk to them for, for those that are spiritual like yourself? Because as, as you told the story of when you walked into church that day and say your chains are broken, your chain, you're free. Yeah. Was that, was that, and this is, you know, this is really spiritual and to your, you're totally to your story, but um, was that God telling you that football was your idol and your focus needs to be on him and not this worldly stuff? And is that, how does that play into, I don't know my question here, but how does that play into your, your story and how you help athletes as well? Yeah, such a great question. And I, and I think it's both, right? So for me, I needed validation that God, this was from you. This transition, like I made the right decision. This was from you. Like this, is, there's going to be purpose in this. I didn't make the wrong decision. I didn't quit too soon. This wasn't like a trial. This wasn't a trial or tribulation that I was supposed to break through and that I was going to come out on the other side that I, I just needed clarification. Like this, you made the right decision. And so I think that that interaction and that exchange in that moment that God and I had, that was for me. And then it was also because then things just started to happen where it was like, oh, this makes total sense. A couple months later, I had my first speaking engagement at Fort Seal, Oklahoma, which was September 6, um, 2012. And so I had a speaking engagement. And then fast forward a couple more months, in the same week, three people asked me, you know, who knew me as a football player and asked me, what am I doing these days? And I told them I'm a motivational speaker. And they said, well, what's the name of your book? And I'm like, the name of my book? I didn't even write my papers in college. What do you mean? What's the name of my book? I'm not doing this. And like, again, that was a sign from God. So I feel like the first one was, okay, hook, line, and sinker. God's like, I got him. Okay. Yep. This is exactly what's supposed to happen. Put me in, an, in front of an audience as a speaker. Now I wasn't good. I will be honest with you. I've done over 250 public speaking engagements since the time I got done playing and I'm a lot better than I was. But what it was is that this is your new football. Like I tell people all the time, like as athletes, as football players, you don't have to stop playing football. You just don't get to tackle people forever. And when you don't get to tackle people forever, it doesn't mean that you still lost purpose. And so I prepare the same way. And so that was my new football. So aside from that, then it's like, oh, I'm actually supposed to be doing these things. So I can speak to an organization in the spiritual realm. I can also go into a public school district and talk about the transition and identity and having transferable skills and understanding networking, how to do it, why it's important, internships, et cetera. Um, and I think that's, again, just what God said, look, this is your gift. I'm going to show you, you know, spiritually, and I'm going to show you in the natural. And so for me, I need to be able to speak to both because we've all heard the people who can just speak to one area and who can speak to one demographic. But for me, I'm called to speak to both. And so if we want to go there, if God says, look, this is your assignment, I need you to go into a church and I need you to speak to spiritual people, then that's the play. And if I need you to go into a school, I need you to go into people who won't even know, they won't even recognize my name because they never heard of me, don't want to hear about me. Let's talk in the natural. And I think the best teachers and leaders, whether we were talking about in the Bible, Jesus, 
talking about Paul. We're talking about all these characters in the Bible who like actually hung out with people who weren't Christians or church people. Um, they were the best teachers. Why? Because they were able to go and communicate with people who weren't. One of the things for me is that I love it. I love it. One of the best compliments as an athlete and now is go, I never knew you were a football player. I didn't know you were an athlete. I didn't know you were an athlete back then. And then when I was playing, I didn't know you're an athlete. I was like, that wasn't what I was supposed to talk about. Because yeah. I don't want you to put me in a box and just every single metaphor, every single analogy you want to use is like, yeah, you know, it's like third down and you got to make a tackle. But I'm, I'm, I haven't played football for 10 years. Let's talk about, let's talk about business. Let's talk about a boardroom. Let's talk about a P and L let's talk about, you know, investments. Let's, let's, let's help me where I am. Don't talk, don't put me there. And so I think with that same mindset, it's that look as athletes, we're all greater than our jerseys. Um, you know, but some, for some strange reason, we forget that we wore the number, we wore the Jersey and the Jersey didn't wear us because we feel like our Superman talents are gone and stripped from us as soon as we leave that Jersey in the locker room. No, and your Superman talents are just beginning. And I've, I've had the privilege of having many NFL, ex NFL guys on here. And it's, uh, it's awesome to see who they've become, who you've mm. become, because yeah. you're utilizing the skills and leadership lessons and, and, personal uh, life lessons that you picked up in the locker room to make you who you are today. And for those that don't know or haven't seen, uh, or, I know it'll be in the bio about Thomas, but you're now a professor at your alma mater, USC, yeah. and you're teaching. Uh, and so it's kind of life has come full circle for you in that regard. Tell the audience what you're teaching, how you're impacting. And then I want to talk about uh, your most impactful work. So give that little uh, yeah. preview as well. Yeah, one of the coolest uh, things that's near and dearest to my heart is my my title at USC as an adjunct professor. Um, and so I teach student athlete success to the incoming freshmen who are transitioning from high school into college. And so, um, you know, we teach some some gen these are generational kids. Some kids, this is third, fourth generation, you know, college student and first gen. And so, being able to help them, you know write an email, being able to help them understand this is how you balance uh, uh, your, your stipend check. This is how you, you know, communicate and correspond with other students on campus. This is, you know, this is your first semester in college, but we're already starting to think about your exit strategy. What's going to be your plan when you're done playing. And so I love it. It's a, it's a 12 week course. Um, and obviously now because of the pandemic, everything's virtual. Um, but one of the coolest things about the classes, the comments that I get about Thomas, how do I navigate going from being the man or woman on campus, like just being the, the top of the top on, on a high school campus to now being, you know, a freshman in college? How do I separate myself? How do I juggle the schedules? And, you know, it's, it's really cool to get our hands on these student athletes at such a young age because they haven't developed any bad habits. Mm -hmm. Like they don't know what they don't know. And so they're just like asking questions like, Hey, how do I do it? What do I do? How do I do it? What do I do? And uh, it's really cool and special. And so it's, it's something that uh, I, I, I don't take lightly and, and definitely think it's, it's part of my life's work. Tell, tell your students that me as a business owner and other business owners, the reason I look for student athletes is because of exactly what you just said is student athletes are forced to juggle more and have more responsibility and therefore come out more prepared, even though, even if they never see the field, even if they're a walk-on backup, which Wisconsin has a lot more than USC. Uh, <laughs> so I know that, but even if they never see the field, the, what they're forced to juggle for show, from showing up to practice, the, uh, uh, the amount of work that's on their calendars versus the normal student and balance and make tough choices uh, that's why I look for them as an employer versus the so standard true. student. That's so true. They need to hear that. I'm going to definitely reiterate that message because so they're going to need to hear it. They do. So awesome. So what do you think? Uh, and cause you've, you've done such a uh, tremendous job so far. And I'm just curious, what do you think has been your most impactful work? And I doubt it's going to have anything to do with football, but what do you think now has been your most impactful work to this point in your life? And then what do you see uh, the next 10 years? Yeah. So my most impactful work is uh, being a father and being a fiance and soon to be husband. And the reason why I mentioned that is because I didn't have my dad in my life growing up, like I had mentioned. 
And, um, you know, sometimes we get afraid and sometimes we get apprehensive because we never had the example or never had the proof. And what I'm learning in both of those situations for my fiance and for my daughter is that the only thing I need to do is be present. Only thing I need to do is show up. The only thing I need to do is give them my undivided attention. And my, my daughter is my biggest accountability partner because I know she's watching everything that I'm doing, which means that every single night I got to get some sleep because tomorrow's going to require my best. And uh, my fiance, she's a big accountability partner for me too, because in the world or through social media or through YouTube, the world might say, Thomas, wow, you're so infectious. Your energy is so positive. Your, your examples, I mean, they just, you know, through the roof. She lives with me every single day. And my goal is for her, for somebody to come up and tell her, hey, you know, your fiance or husband is this. And she goes, I know I live with him. And so that's, that's, that's my greatest work. Um, in the next 10 years, what the goal is to be um, is I want to be the transition guru. I want to be, I want to help athletes transition. Um, so I have a program called greater than your Jersey, which are coined or coined the phrase of between the ears from the neck up. And it's, it's everything for, for athletes to understand that they don't need their Jersey to be great because we have this big problem of expect greatness on the field or on the court, whichever your sport is, but we accept mediocrity in the rest of life. And so if you stop playing at 18, 28, 38, you know, God willing, you're going to live a lot of life. And so I don't want people to think that their best life is behind them. I feel like it's a springboard and, you know, we're, we're great human beings that just so happen to be great athletes. And so how do we take that mindset and apply it for the rest of our lives so that sports was a, a stepping stone? I like to call it sports was my JV and, and life is my varsity. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm really focused on for the next 10 years. Man, that's awesome. How old's your daughter? Eight months. Eight Pray months, me. man. <laughs> You're, uh, how's sleep? Um, uh, I, I get it. I get it when I can. <laughs> <laughs> man i got i got four i got uh three daughters and one son now nine Whoa. seven five three uh Whoa. so sleep's getting better uh, <laughs> but uh yeah man i i know exactly where you're at it's tough and those uh little girls to to daddies like uh the first time a little girl looks up at you and smiles over it's done. It's done. <laughs> She's already training me right now. She has this thing where uh, she taps me on the shoulder or on my chest. She has one hand on my shoulder, one hand on my chest and taps me like this. And it's like, daddy, I need you to pay attention to me. And it's just like everything else kind of gets put to ease. And I go, yes, babe, what do you want? And so she's already starting to train me. I'm in training camp. I, I thought I was never going to do another training camp, but I'm in training camp again. Well, she's training you. You're training her. One of the best <laughs> things that I've done uh, with my girls because of the superficial world that we live in. Uh, and I, I don't know if I've even talked about this on our show, which is a shame. Um, but someone stole my stole it, gave me credit for as he put it in his book. But uh, I said, hey, where does beautiful come from? And mm. even like so even at like one years old, as they start to understand, they say, where does beautiful come from? And they'll point to their heart. Wow. And now they'll say it. Right. Yeah. And I said, where does your heart come from? And I say, Jesus. Wow. I'm writing this down. So, I mean, it's so impactful to me or, or so uh, it's so important to me, I should say, to teach them that their worth is not of this world. Mm -hmm. And whether someone's spiritual or not, but I mean, the, the point is, is that Instagram and magazines and everyone else's opinion of them is not their worth. Right. Their worth comes from themselves, first and foremost. Mm -hmm mom and dad, and most importantly, God. Yes. So, so that's why I just, it was fun teaching them as they got uh, younger. And I'm, I don't know if I stole it from someone or I made it up. I'm taking credit for it now. But uh, It's yours. I just wrote it down. But uh, but uh, having little girls, like, you know, for, for little boys, so like you and I growing up, we didn't get taught that emotional thing. I'm letting yeah. my son learn emotions, and that's okay. If he would cry, I'm not telling him not to cry or stop crying. Right. Like my dad did to me. And that's how my dad was taught. So now I know better. So I must do better. Of right? course. So, and then for little girls is making sure that uh, their self-worth is always at the highest. Oh, I love it. I love it, Josh. I'm going to borrow that. Thank you. You bet. I, I was told uh, early on in my career that uh, if you steal one idea from one person that's plagiarism, you steal a hundred ideas or a thousand ideas from a thousand people, that's called research. 
There it is. That's right. Oh. <laughs> I love it. So it's good. So uh, one of the things that you told uh, Chad that you said that football or sports doesn't create leaders, it creates great followers. Yeah. Explain that a little bit because I find that really interesting. I think I know that, especially as being an athlete, um, I might not have thought that when I was an athlete, but I think the the general uh, public probably looks at that, especially NFL, because it's one of the more public things, or NBA players, uh, as all leaders because they made it to some, the pinnacle of that sport. Yeah. So it's, and I didn't find this out until having a conversation with my fiance's father who um, did like 30 years in the Marines, like is like one of the most stand up human beings that I've ever met. And so we have these really interesting conversations about leadership. Um, And then I had the same conversation with her nephew, who's also in the military and I'm, and he's 20 years, he's like 15 years younger than I am. And so I was like, wow, how did you guys learn that? Because I still don't know these things. And then I started to have a, a, a couple of her thoughts about, why don't I know this? And it's because football, and I can only say football because I played it. I don't want to take credit and you know speak on any other sport, but football teaches you to be a great follower. Coach says, line up right here, look at this key and do this. As soon as they do this, you do this. And so it's not too much leadership as far as, hey, kind of do whatever you want to. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, we have this saying, me and my friends, that football is smart enough to line up, dumb enough to play. (laughs) Meaning it's like smart enough to like know exactly where you're supposed to stand, but don't do anything outside of what we're telling you to do. Which if you think about it, it's very similar to, um, I was in Africa. I took my mom to Africa three years ago for her 55th birthday. And so- we were on a safari and the lions were the, one of the coolest things that we had a chance to see on the safari. And my mom asked this question and God bless her heart. Cause she asked like the best questions that no one else would think about. And so my mom asked the question of what makes these lions different from the lions in the, in the um, zoo. And I was like, dang mom, that's a good question. And the, 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 the guy who was giving us our tour said that if you remove the lions from the zoo and bring them out here, they'll get eaten alive. I was like, what do you mean? It's a lion. A lion is a lion is a lion. He said, those lions forgot how to hunt because they were removed from their natural habitat. So now all of their food comes to them. They don't have to hunt and go get their food, which everything that makes a lion is their hunter's DNA. Like Mm -hmm. I'm going to hunt. I'm going to get it. Everything that's in my sight is mine, right? I'm the king of the jungle. And so um, I thought it was super interesting because that's the same way as athletes, professional athletes and, and collegiate athletes is that you're told every, you, 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 you live life, you do life on your own as you're supposed to. Then you come into college and you play professional sports. And then the, the coach says, all right, this is your schedule. This is what time you eat. These are the foods you're going to eat. This is how much you're going to weigh. This is your position. This is how much you're going to train. This is the assignment. This is school. I mean, everything is pretty much to the T done for you. And then as soon as your eligibility is up or as soon as your career is up, they say, now go figure it out. You've robbed me for the last four, five, 10, 15 years of my life from figuring it out myself. Why? Hey coach, I was thinking about how many times has an athlete heard this? Don't think, we don't pay you to think. That's not what we pay you to do. We pay you to react, respond, do what you've been coached to do. So the reason why I was talking with Chad about that is because as people think like, wow, you guys are great leaders. We're, we have leadership qualities, but we're not actually great leaders because an athlete hasn't taken a practice. Uh, uh, no football player I know is part of outside of Tom Brady and Peyton Manning and like the elitist has, has, has just kind of come up with a practice schedule or a game schedule on their mm-hmm. own. They've all been told what to do. This is individual. This is team. This is nine on seven. This is one-on-ones. This is stretch. This is, I mean, you go down the list. And so um, one of the things that, that I really harp on and focus on is I ask open-ended questions. So in every single one of our sessions, every single one of our classes, we have an in-class activity and we have a, an after-class assignment. And so it's your thoughts. I don't care. I don't care. Like, for example, our, our last one was if you were to email a professor, if you were to email a professor to connect with them on office hours, how would you do it? And so I, I don't tell them, we don't, we don't sit there and say, this is what you need to put in the subject. This is the beginning. This is the end. It's how would you do it? 
Because in the world, when you're done playing, you're going to have to call your dentist and say, hi, uh, I need to get a teeth clean on Wednesday. You're going to have to schedule an appointment to go to the doctors. You're going to have to book a, a, a plane ticket. I mean, for me, I, I learned that lesson when I got done playing and I was 15 minutes late for a doctor's appointment as soon as I got done playing. And I was like, hey, sorry, traffic, 15 minutes late. And the lady was like, oh, no worries, but um, we don't have an appointment available for the next two hours. So you can go to the cafeteria, take a drive around, walk around, but we'll call you. And I'm like, call me. For, up until my life until then, it was, okay, Thomas, we'll put you in a room and we'll, we'll bump someone else. Now, all of a sudden, I'm a former player and now I'm getting bumped. Yeah. Yeah. And so learning that, it was, wow, I'm really good at taking orders, but I'm not so good at being a leader. And so in order to break that chain and, and, and change that narrative, uh, we ask open-ended questions and we ask, also ask like real questions. I don't, I don't want to hear it from an academic advisor, from a, from, a, from a teacher's assistant, from a professor, like they got too much on their plate. If, you, if, I can, if I can get my athlete to understand offense, defense, special teams against a different opponent every single week for four and five years, then I can get them to understand the perplexities of life. Oh, that's really good, man. I want to be respectful of your time. So let's get to the word game. You let's ready? do it. All yes, right. sir. Passion. Which wakes me up. Purpose. Why I was born. Trust. Um, easily earned. Time. The most important thing. Fame. Used to want it, not anymore. Failure. Only when you quit. Success. Something I'll never reach, but always aspire. Sacrifice. The thing that separates those who do and those who don't. Inspire. My calling card. Impact. Things that people are supposed to do. That's good. What were you thinking about there? Man, impact. The reason why it took me so long to answer impact, I believe. Man, I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think because impact is, it's like that knockout punch. Impact is the, is, the, is the biggest responsibility that we're supposed to have. Yeah, what else are we here for, right? Right. So whether you believe in God or not, it's like there's a, there's a higher purpose for all of our lives. Mm. But, so I didn't know if you were there. That's, that's awesome that your mind went there. I didn't know if your mind went there because sometimes you think impact, collision, right? Yeah. You know, which would be natural for a former you know, NFL player. But, yeah, no, that's great. That's Man, awesome. that's awesome. I love that. So it's, it's, it makes you think, and especially when you can't repeat yourself, it's like, it's like, let's just draw some good juice. Yeah. Let's keep going. I love it. I love it. All right. So we got just a couple last things. What's your favorite book of all time or most recently read you want to give a shout out to? Man, favorite book of all time was the first book I ever read cover to cover, which was six months after I graduated college. <laughs> Chewing that. Um, See You at the Top by Zig Ziglar. Oh, Good. I haven't heard Zig's name brought up in a while. That's great. And one of the yeah. most famous, unique voices of all time. Man. All right. Uh, so I want to give a shout out to you as well. How, how can people follow you, uh, get in touch with you, uh, book you? Like This has been such a great conversation. I know a lot of people are going to get a lot out of it. So what's, what's the best way to go about that? Yeah. It's, uh, you know, first and foremost is the website. Um, you can get in contact with me there, which is Thomas R. Williams dot com um instagram which is mr mr underscore trw and then linkedin which is thomas r williams um but you know through through that and an email will be on the website but man yeah let's connect um let's impact and then let's shift uh perspectives knowing that you know it's it's not what you it's not what it looks like it's what it is Man, that's so good. This has been such a great conversation. I appreciate your time. I know we're out of time, so 
want to be respectful of that. Uh, but everyone out there, get in, follow Thomas, follow us at Inspire People Impact Lives, listen to the podcast, share the podcast. Thomas has killed it today. So for the rest of you, get out there and inspire and impact. We'll see you next time.